much, all of you, for joining. It is great to have all of you, and in particular, to have uh, our new friends at Temple Beth Am in Florida to be learning with you today. Uh, thank you for joining us and for your co-sponsorship of today's program. And we look forward to getting to know you all better, whether you are local or um, or wherever you are around the country or around the world. So we are thrilled today to learn about uh, the secret war against hate, American resistance to anti-Semitism and white supremacy after 1945. I mean, I, I mean, I guess we're not thrilled to learn about it, <laughs> but we're thrilled to learn about it with you. And um, let me tell you a little bit about our scholar here today. Professor Stephen J. Ross is Distinguished Professor of History, Dean's Professor of History, and Director of the Uni University of Southern California's Kasdan Institute for the Study of the Jewish Role in American Life. His most recent book, Hitler in Los Angeles, How Jews Foiled Nazi Plots Against Hollywood, and America was named the finalist for the uh, Pulitzer Prize in History in 2018, and has been on the LA Times bestseller list for 23 weeks. His previous book, Hollywood Left and Right, How Movie Stars Shaped American Politics, received the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences Film Scholars Award and a Pulitzer Prize nomination. Working Class Hollywood, Silent Film and the Shaping of Class in America, won the Theater Library Association Book Award for 1999, as well as a nomination for the Pulitzer Prize and National Book Award. Ross's current book, The Secret War Against Hate, American Resistance to White Supremacy After 1945, will be published by Bloomsbury Press and is the topic of our learning today. Thank you all so much again for joining us and Professor Ross, over to you. Hi everyone, uh, thank you for having invited me. I'm going to pull up a PowerPoint so that uh, you can see some of the images I'll be talking about today. So let's start with the idea that on January 6, 2021, Americans were shocked as they watched tens of thousands of self-proclaimed patriots storm the Capitol, many proudly carrying Confederate flags. And many citizens have blamed Donald Trump for promoting the hate-filled day, but it would be mistake, it would be a big mistake to blame Trump, nor will the hate end when he leaves the public arena, not only office, but the public arena. What the nation witnessed that afternoon was bigger than any one person or party. What we witnessed was the beginning of a second civil war over two distinct visions of the American future, a distinct vision, two distinct visions that have been fought over to today. And it's not only nationalism, but as we see here, the imagery was filled with both Confederate flags, symbolizing the racism of these people, but also two uh, instances here, uh, 6MWE, which stands for 6 million was not enough. And over here on the right, Camp Auschwitz. Um, well, Americans like to believe that the end of World War II brought a new era um, of tolerance in America and a decrease in hate. Nothing could be further from the truth. According to 14 public opinion polls taken in 1945, 25% of Americans were infected with anti-Semitism, 25% were opposed to anti-Semitism, and 50% said they had no fixed opinion and could be swung to either side. Now, no poster ever asked a respondent, are you a racist? But when asked in September 1945, the same question in more polite ways, which is, would you favor a law requiring employers to hire a person qualified for the job regardless of their race? 43% of Americans said yes, 44% said no, and 13% said they had no opinions. What we see here then in 1945 is despite fighting a war against Nazism and fascism, Americans were deeply divided over race and anti-Semitism. And I would argue that as soon as World War II ended, a new battle began on American soil, and it's a battle that has lasted to today, beyond January 6th. It's being fought out right now in Congress over the Speaker as well. You have a lot of right-wing anti-Semites trying to hold up the vote for Speaker of the House and trying to get even more power. Well, <clears throat> many of the veterans who returned home from World War II 
were profoundly affected by what they uh, had experienced. And here's the more familiar image. People come home from war. We see that uh, the sailor kissing on Times Square. And it's kind of Kumbaya America. It's what Tom Brokaw has talked about, the greatest generation who went off to war and came back with a new sensibility of differences. And you had the Jew, the Catholic, the Protestant, the Muslim, all fighting together. Uh, black and whites pretty much segregated. But by the end of the war, there was a new sense of appreciation that, well, I may not want you to marry my sister. You deserve to live a life free of harm and intimidation. You basically deserve to live a life in a democratic nation where who you are, not what your background is, determines where you succeed or fail in life. And these were the veterans Tom Brokaw hailed as the greatest generation. Well, as for black and Jewish veterans, they shed their blood and quote, made major contributions to the war effort. And they had decided that the time would come, the time had come when they would no longer accept second class citizenship, especially black soldiers who we see here were segregated into all black units. But this represents the darker side of the war. Many men who went to war, they went, they went to war not because they hated Hitler and Nazism and fascism and Mussolini and Tojo. They simply went to war because Japan had bombed us. And when someone bombs you, you hit them back. They didn't like Jews and blacks before the war and they didn't like serving with them during the war. And they certainly didn't want anything to do with them after the war. In fact, those veterans, largely from the South and the Southwest, who came home said, we're happy to deal with Blacks and Jews, but we want things to be the way they were before the war, where we had no trouble with Blacks and Jews as long as they knew their place. And the only time there was violence is when they didn't know their place. And many of these veterans came back. And here's the real key. When you read what's going on today, and particularly what went on on January 6th, many of these people are showing up with American flags and Confederate flags. They see themselves as patriots. And to say they aren't is to not understand what they're fighting for. And this goes back, as I say, to 1945, because they came back from war. They said, we went to war for several years. We served our nation. And when we came back, we were betrayed that Congress had to pass all kinds of legislation that would make it easier for Jews and Blacks to compete for jobs and for housing. They had ended the Southern way of life and were imposing Northern liberalism on the rest of America. This was not okay. They then envisioned themselves as the true patriots who would be willing to kill to save America. This is the legacy left by the fathers and grandfathers of contemporary hate groups. Their sons, daughters, grandsons, and granddaughters could be seen saving America by storming the Capitol on January 6, 2021. The United States war in Europe and the Pacific lasted four years, but domestic hate has persisted until today. And the story I tell begins after the war, uh, starting in late 1945, Emery Burke, Jesse B. Stoner, James Madoff, and later George Lincoln Rockwell led a war of hate that promised to finish the job Hitler had begun. They would build violent networks of terror and they were planning deadly attacks on Jews and blacks. All four of these men, or revered today as four of the leading godfathers of white supremacy. But these four men were in fact opposed and their hate groups were opposed by three New York based groups, the Anti-Defamation League, the American Jewish Committee, and the Non-Sectarian Anti-Nazi League, uh, all of whom sent in spies, undercover agents, both to observe and in some cases, agent provocateurs who were supposed to penetrate, rise to positions of leadership and help those uh, organizations to implode from within. And from 1945 until the late 1970s, 
And in the case of the Anti-Defamation League until today, these three groups ran secret operations aimed to protect Jews and Blacks from harm. Why? Because Jews and Blacks knew they could not rely on the FBI for protection. FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover displayed little concern for the rapid growth of American-based Nazi and fascist organizations before, during, and after the war. Instead, he preferred to focus his resource on investigating alleged communists. Consequently, with no one to protect them, <clears throat> not local police, not local sheriff, and not local FBI, the leaders of these three Jewish groups had to protect Jews and blacks from harm on their own. Well, the first instance came with the appearance of the Colombians, a group formed in the fall of 1946 that returned terror to the South and especially to Atlanta that soon became the Munich of post-war America. Who were the uh, <clears throat> Colombians think that if the Ku Klux Klan and the Nazi-inspired German-American Bund were to have an offspring, it would look exactly like the Colombians. As most Americans prepared for post-war peace, Colombian founders Homer Loomis Jr. and Emery Burke proposed fighting a new war. And to quote Emery Burke, what Germans have done to the Jews will be a mere tea party compared to what we're going to do to them. We lost the war in Europe, but we're going to win the war at home. Well, Chardon in August 1946, Loomis and Burke, who are here on the left and the right, uh, proposed to create a national movement by doing two things. First, to create a climate of terror amongst Black and Jews, and then secondly, to organize a new political party, the Colombian Party, that would pass measures expelling the two hated groups from America, and any Jew or Black who refused to leave would be immediately executed. Now, this was no pipe dream because the Colombians quickly established alliances with like-minded, quote, racial purity groups in Minneapolis, Indianapolis, Chattanooga, Jacksonville, Washington, D.C., Los Angeles, Philadelphia, New York, and Milwaukee. And Burke and Loomis prepared for war by assembling an arsenal of rifles, machine guns, and dynamite. And as we see on the slide here, their first attack came on October 28, 1946, when Colombian Ralph Childers beat a black teenager, Clifford Hines, for the crime of walking through a white neighborhood. Three days later, the Colombians bombed the home of Mr. and Mrs. Frank Jones, who committed the unpardonable sin of moving into the city's white working class West End neighborhood. Well, after hearing about the anti-Semitic group, James Sheldon, the head of the uh, New York-based uh, non-sectarian anti-Nazi league, struck a deal with Southern born journalist Stetson Kennedy. In return for joining the Colombians and Ku Klux Klan under an assumed name and sending him reports of their meeting, Sheldon promised to pay the 30-year-old $50 a week, which would be roughly $650 a week uh, for his services. Well, <clears throat> Sheldon uh, shared Kennedy's reports with Georgia's crusading assistant attorney general, Daniel Duke. Uh, and they needed more than just those reports. They needed hard evidence. And Duke uh, asked um, Sheldon to send in agent provocateurs from New York who could gather the evidence needed to put the Colombians out of business. And here's uh, Stetson Kennedy who joined under a phony name. Uh, they gave him a lot of credence because his real life uncle was the head of the Klan in Jacksonville, Florida. Well, Sheldon sent in two of his most experienced undercover operatives to break up the group. Mario Buzzy and Renee Fuchtenberg. And you see uh, Renee here. Sheldon is the one in the glasses carrying over. And those are two uh, Colombians who they managed to uh, get to turn state's evidence. While arriving in Atlanta in early November 1946, Buzzy introduced himself 
to Emery Burke, the main leader of the group, as Mario Falco, an Italian fascist who came to Atlanta hoping to organize the city's Italian community into an anti-Semitic organization. And Burke welcomed the newcomer into the group, and he was especially delighted when Mario introduced his attractive comrade, Rene Forrest, whose real name was Fruchtenberg, who offered to work as Loomis's personal secretary. What the fascist leader never suspected was that Rene spent her evenings photographing their records on a camera disguised as a cigarette lighter. Sheldon then sent the documents to David Duke and also to Georgia's Attorney General Eugene Cook. And in February 1947, with over 200 pages of evidence that were provided by the two spies, and on the right you see Mario Buzzy here holding up dynamite, uh, they were able to uh, secure guilty verdicts against Burke, uh, who was sentenced to three years in jail, and Loomis, who was sentenced to three and a half years in jail, both sentenced for riot and usurpation of police powers. The problem is, hate was not confined to any one group, any one person, or any region. And the collapse of the Colombians presented an opportunity for Jesse Stoner and his Christian anti-Jewish party. Declaring his party 100% for white supremacy, the former Colombian and Ku Klux Klan leader called for every black man, woman, and child to be deported from, uh, to Africa and for every Jew to be exterminated immediately. And his incentive for action was alluring. He wrote on various flyers that when Jews were dead, American Christians would share their money and all would become wealthy beyond their wildest dreams. And I just want to add that uh, the Ku Klux Klan was the moderate group at that time because they considered the Colombians and the Christian anti-Jewish party so extreme in their racial views, they expelled them from the Klan and expelled them from any alliance. Well, a childhood battle with polio left Stoner, with a, who we see here in the midst of a Klan rally, with a lifelong lip and a chip on both shoulders. In late 1946, he founded the Stoner Anti-Jewish Party. Two years later, he ran uh, for Congress on a platform that would make Judaism a crime punishable by death. And in 1952, <clears throat> aided by former Colombian Edward Fields, Stoner's party renamed his party the Christian Anti-Jewish Party and promised to modernize the mass killing of Jews by employing gas chambers, electric chairs, firing squads, or what he told his audience, whatever seems most appropriate. Once in power, Stoner promised that his party would amend the Constitution so that only white Gentiles can live in America. And Southerners seemed attracted to the party's longstanding mantra, quote, when the Jews are gone, the Americans will own rich America. Well, the three New York-based groups sent in undercover agents who provided information that led to the party's demise, but not Stoner. In 1953, Stoner and Fields traveled to New York City to support the man they considered the next great American Fuhrer, James Madoff. Now, just one note, when I say I'm looking at these four godfathers of white supremacy, there are many other hate group leaders like Gerald L. K. Smith, uh, but what makes these people special is that they were dedicated to lifelong political campaign. They weren't looking simply for an election, they weren't looking to participate in politics for one or two or even 10 years. They were devoting decades of their life to the cause. And all four men worked with one another for their entire lives, each wanting to be the main nationalist leader, but each willing to take a turn as the co-star while somebody else was trying to establish a greater hold. Now, most Americans are familiar with Southern hate groups like the Ku Klux Klan, but few know that New York City was the epicenter of post-war Nazi movement in America, and that James Madoff, pictured here at the podium, hoped to head an international alliance of fascist groups power powerful enough to unseat democratic governments 
and eliminate all minorities. As he told his supporters, what Hitler accomplished in uh, Europe, the National Renaissance Party shall accomplish in America. And in 1949, declaring America needed to be saved from the Jewish menace, the then 22 year old founded the National Renaissance Party, an avowedly anti Semitic and anti Black group. And from then until his death in May 1979, he held weekly rallies in the heavily pro Nazi York neighborhood of Manhattan. For those of you who know New York City, that's the East 80s from basically around 79th Street up until around 90th or so. Well, Madoff's nine point pro program of na racial nationalism called for the deportation of all racial elements that cannot be assimilated into the quote, culturally predominant white race, Puerto Ricans, Negroes, and Asiatics. They would simply be deported. As for the Jews, forget deportation, he called for the quote, physical, ex immediate physical extermination of all Jews. And although the National Renaissance Party pay membership never totaled more than several hundred, his National Renaissance Bulletin attracted uh, the devoted right-wing leaders and former Nazis throughout the world. You need to think of the National Renaissance Party as the Facebook and Twitter of its time. In many nations, particularly Germany, uh, anti-Semitic writings were prohibited. Therefore, uh, various Nazi leaders who had remained in Europe and also who fled to uh, Latin America, Central America, and to Australia would read the National Renaissance Bulletin to get information and to write into its directors to get things that they could not get from a normal newspaper. Well, in late May 1953, World War II Army veteran Emmanuel Trujillo saw Madoff hailing Hitler and Senator Joe McCarthy on the East 86th Street. And the speaker, he heard a speaker say, quote, it's okay to kill Jews and Negroes as they're all communists. And after observing a New York City police chief congratulating Madoff for his excellent speech, the army veteran approached uh, the anti-Nazi league and volunteered to go undercover. Well, after proving himself a fearless fighter in um, fist fights, Madoff asked Trujillo, who went under the assumed name of Mana Trujillo, to join his inner circle of stormtroopers known as the Elite Guard. And Trujillo quickly moved up in the Nazi hierarchy, and he wondered what would happen if he was ever exposed. He said, if they ever find out who I am, it will be just too bad, meaning they would kill him. Well, Sheldon responded by sending in three more spies to help uh, Manny uh, Truehill. Irene Duval, who went by the name of Ruth Ross and served as Trujillo's chief assistant. Larry Sestito, the American representative to the Italian fascist department, a party, and John Langrod, who posed as a college student interested in learning more. But Madoff was especially uh, enthralled with Trujillo, and after he discovered that Trujillo, who had served in Germany at the end of the war, could read and speak German fluently, he appointed him director of their overseas operation, which meant that um, he was in charge of being in contact with every major fascist and Nazi leader abroad. And they all wrote him as director of under overseas operation to get information about where could they get money, where could they get uh, guns, weapons, ammunition, and where could they contact like-minded people who they could form an international fascist alliance with. Well, in 1953, Madoff's dreams of becoming the Adolf Hitler of America seemed to be happening. Trujillo was corresponding with over 200 fascist leaders throughout the world. He recruited uh, H. Keith Thomason, the man we see here in the trench coat, and right behind him in the brown shirt is Manny, Manny Truehill, uh, tr that um, Thompson would run for Congress as his first National Renaissance Party 
candidate. But it all fell apart. Uh, in fact, in November 1953, the Anti-Defamation League exposed Truhill as a communist who had penetrated the National Renaissance Party. And at first, uh, Madoff refused to believe it was true, but eventually he realized it was, and it put the National Renaissance Party into a still into a tailspin for many years. Its foreign correspondents stopped writing, believing they had been penetrated by the Jews and they could no longer trust Madoff. Well, but there would be no rest for the Anti-Nazi League, Anti-Defamation League, or American Jewish Committee for two new threats soon emerged, a series of synagogue and church bombings, and then the founding of George Lincoln Rockwell's American Nazi Party. The first of these occurred on 3.30 a.m. on October 12, 1958. A bomb went off destroying much of Atlanta's uh, Hebrew Benevolent Congregation, which was the leading Jewish reform synagogue in, Amer in the American South. Only one man was arrested, George Bright. The 34-year-old engineer and Army demolitions veteran was set free after a jury deadlocked nine to three in favor of conviction. As one of the three voting to acquit him explained, you can't send a man to penitentiary for life just because he's a Jew hater. Well, the Atlanta Temple was one of more than two dozen synagogues and black churches that were bombed during the 50s. Many in response to the Supreme Court's 1954 Brown versus Board of Education decision. And Bright, and here's where I want to stress the interconnectedness of these hate groups. As one is put down, they simply move to another. Bright had been a former Colombian and had been a Klan uh, member, and more importantly, a, a supporter of J.B. Stoner. And during a nine week period, beginning in Christmas 1959, over 600 synagogues, Jewish day schools, residences, and shops throughout the country were targeted for vandalism or destruction. The Anti-Defamation League, American Jewish Committee, and Anti-Nazi League responded to repeated attacks by stepping up their spying operations. The ADL, placed undercover operatives inside Southern citizen councils and in a number of anti-Jewish groups throughout the country. And in one instance, information the ADL's Miami head, B. Botnick, uh, provided the FBI led to the arrest of several Ku Klux Klan bombers. Well, spies from the three New York groups slowed down the bombings, but soon faced a new threat, the formation of the National States Rights Party in 1958 by J.B. Stoner uh, and James Madoff's uh, and Edward Fields, who was uh, Stoner's protege. And then in 1959, launching the uh, American Nazi Party. And here's J.B. Stoner who tried, one of the things that makes these four men unique is not only did they work together, but they uh, spent most of their lives trying to forge alliance with hate groups around the country. And in fact, <clears throat> the, three, the three leaders of the Anti-Defamation League, American Jewish Committee, and Anti-Nazi League, uh, back in May 1945, at the end of the war, just before VE Day, they all wrote letters, memos that I found in archives saying the same thing, which is we expect an increase in hate after the war, not a decrease. And our greatest fear was that somehow these groups would figure out a way to unite, that we can bring down any one group, including the Ku Klux Klan. But if all the groups in America figure out a way to unite and create a single nationalist party, which is what they call themselves, not Nazis or fascists, but nationalists who would save America, then we are in trouble. And the other concern they said, which was prescient, was what we are also afraid of, is that some of these far right wing nuts would make their way into one of the two mainstream parties and would turn their hate agenda into a legitimate part 
of one of our two parties' platforms. Well, the fourth and most prominent of these hate group leaders, George Lincoln Rockwell, his flair for the dramatic attracted a cadre of former military personnel, young toughs, and longtime haters in search of a leader who reflected their ideas. Now, Rockwell had enlisted in the Naval uh, Air Corps in March 1941, and like most of these hate group leaders, they were all veterans. And he served until 1945 when he was be, um, demobilized as a lieutenant commander, but he returned to active duty in 1950 to train fighter pilots for the Korean War. And a year later, he talked about having a conversion experience while reading Mein Kampf. As he wrote in his autobiography, I was transfixed, hypnotized. I realized that National Socialism, the iconoclastic worldview of Adolf Hitler, was the doctrine of scientific racial idealism, actually a new religion. And in 1958, he joined Stoner Fields and Colombian co-founder Emery Burke and 100 delegates from 18 states to form the National States Rights Party, which was the successor to Stoner's Christian anti-Jewish party. And again, each of the leaders wanted to be the leader of the national group. So in 1959, he moved, Rockwell moved to Arlington, Virginia, and founded the American Nazi Party. And it was Rockwell who brought the um, anti-Semitic fascist movement into the national arena by being its first media star. He understood more than anyone else, how to use the media to get publicity. And he always gained national attention by appearing in Nazi uniforms and surrounding himself with stormtroopers and swastika flags. Rockwell, Rockwell adopted a platform taken directly from the Colombians and Stoner's anti-Jewish party. He called for the extermination of all Jews and to send all American blacks to Africa. Well, Rockwell succeeded in recruiting members of Stoner's inner circle, but his victory had one fatal flaw. Several of those men were working for the Anti-Nazi League or for the uh, Anti-Defamation anti League. Well, Madoff and Rockwell soon realized their organizations had been penetrated by the Jews, and this time the spy masters as well as the spies were targeted for death. As one anti-Nazi League agent warned his boss, James Sheldon, be on guard for Rockwell says he would like to cut you up and send your body in a box to the ADL offices. Well, dissension uh, between these various leaders led to splinter groups. Uh, by the way, here's Madoff, uh, rather um, <clears throat> Rockwell, in the midst of uh, organizing in Mississippi, Freedom Riders in 1961, and they would continue going down from 61 to 64. As they were going down uh, south to register black voters, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, Rockwell put together his hate bus tour of Nazis. The irony here, if you look at the man all the way on your left here, and here, Daniel Burroughs, Daniel Burroughs committed suicide a day after the New York Times exposed him as a Jew with Orthodox parents who had been bar mitzvahed. Well, Rockwell always uh, not only gained attention by um, those stunts, but he tried to forge an alliance with Malcolm X and Elijah Muhammad in the Nation of Islam, or, or arguing that they shared a similar desire for segregation that they wanted uh, nothing to do with each other, with blacks or whites, and that if in fact they could combine their groups, they might succeed in achieving that end. Well, Rockwell's assassination in August 1967 uh, led to the decline of the American Nazi party. And while his followers would form a number of different splinter groups, uh, James Madoff emerged as the nation's undisputed Nazi leader, uh, calling out for kill the Jews. He argued that kill is not an ugly word. It is a right to destroy an enemy. There can be no coexistence 
between the two races, one must lose. As we see here, there was a last ditch attempt in 1968 by the remaining three leaders, Burke, Madoff, and Stoner. Uh, they called for a grand convention in Washington, D.C. of an assembly of racist movements that would draw all these people and their 10 million supporters, allegedly 10 million, against Black and Jews. And it wasn't just Rockwell, but Madoff was also forging alliances with Black separatist groups. Well, Madoff's dream of becoming the American Hitler ended after he died of cancer in 1979. But although the tactics, strategies, and operatives would change, the struggle to protect Jews and Blacks from harm has remained the enduring mission of those three New York groups. Believing democracy required constant vigilance, they envisioned a nation where Americans protected other Americans from harm, no matter their race, religion, or ethnicity. And more often than not, they succeeded. And these groups never disappeared. They simply went underground until Donald Trump emerged. And here we have the Unite the Right rally at Charlottesville in August 2017 uh, that mimicked uh, the earlier uh, movements. And Americans were shocked when in this rally at Charlottesville, those groups chanted, the Jews will not replace us. I just want to note that in the 1940s and 50s, they weren't saying the Jews will not replace us. They were calling for the immediate extermination of all Jews. Well, the shock of Charlottesville turned to horror as anti-Semitic attacks grew more deadly over the next several years, from the attack at the Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh that killed 11, to the Chabad congregation shooting that left one dead in Poway, California. And America, many Americans have asked, how could this happen? How could this happen? They should not be surprised. Those shootings and the continued anti-Semitic violence we have today are a part of a long-standing battle that stretches back to World War II, when American soldiers returned with two radically different visions of the nation's religious and racial future, and they were willing to kill for it. And the story I tell in The Secret War Against Hate ends in late 70s, but Nazis, Klansmen, and white supremacists persist to today. And one of the keys to understanding that persistence of hate is the fact that so many hate group leaders served their apprenticeship with the Colombians, Stoner Anti-Jewish Party, National Renaissance Party, National States Rights Party, or American Nazi Party. Uh, and these four men that I write about helped inspire and shape today's nationalist movement, many of which adhere to their preachings. For example, uh, in football, they talk about the coaches tree, where a prominent coach like our Ram Sean McVay uh, has, through his assistant coaches, many of them have gotten head jo jobs as head coaches. Well, it's the same thing in the hate movement. Many serve as foot soldiers and eventually move on to organize their own. And some of the most prominent ones, Richard Butler, who had worked with Madoff, who had worked with Stoner, uh, who had worked with Burke, went on to be the founder of the Aryan Nations. David Duke, who was a disciple of Jesse Stoner and a leading Klansman, would go on to serve in Congress. Richard Barrett was the founder of the Idaho skinhead movement. Harold Covington's successor to Rockwell would found the White People's Party, which still exists. And Matt Cole, who had been the right-hand man for Madoff and then Rockwell would found the new order, yet another Nazi party. Well, this is a story that has not been told before. And hopefully my book of which this talk is drawn from will give tribute to Robert Foster, George Kelman, James Sheldon, 
and the men and women who risked their lives running undercover operations, all of whom understood one thing. Democracy requires constant vigilance. The citizen spies who worked for those three groups were almost all white and Christian, yet they never saw themselves as protecting Jews or blacks. They saw themselves as protecting fellow Americans from harm. And theirs is a story worth telling over and over again. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Ross. Um, we'd love to open it up to questions. Um, if anyone wants to raise their hand, uh, feel free to unmute and, and ask a question. Can I ask, where, where are we now? I mean, it, it, it kind of seems, you know, Jews were more accepted in society in terms of, well, Biden has Jewish grandchildren, and the last few presidents, you know, have children married Jews. And yet the anti-Semitism for both right and left is climbing. So where do you see where we are now and what can we do about it? Thanks. Uh, well, where we are now, as I've tried to say, is where we've been since 1945, with some periods being more intense than other periods. And as for what you can do, um, you know, that's a tough question. If I really had an answer to that, I wouldn't be a professor. I'd be out there uh, on the streets talking to people. Uh, but the one thing we can do, uh, whether you're willing to do it is another thing, because many people are rightly intimidated. If you hear hate speech, if you hear somebody making anti-Semitic or racist statements, open your mouth and say something and simply say, you know what? I, I'm an American. In America, we don't talk this way about other groups. You don't have to love everybody, but we don't talk hate and we don't talk violence against other Americans. And if you see something uh, or hear something that's really dangerous, call your police or call the ADL and let them know. Depending where you are, the police in some parts of the country still don't care. They're not going to listen. It's just the good old boys acting out. Uh, and that hasn't changed since the 40s. Great. We have a hand up from uh, our friend Michael Cronenfeld and then Aglaia. Hi, Michael. Hi. Um, a quick question. We've been watching this farce going on in the House of Representatives for the last three or four days. Do you see any links or connections between this far extreme right Republican segment and some of the anti Semitism and racism and, and hate that's been growing up in the country? Absolutely. Uh, what we see is the fulfillment of what I mentioned that memo, the second part of that memo that the three leaders, three Jewish leaders, wrote in 1945 that our great fear is that one day this anti-Semitism, this virulent anti-Semitism and racism would make its way into one of the two parties. And it has certainly made its way into the far right wing of the Republican party. The people who are holding up right now, uh, the election of a speaker of the house. These are people like, well, Marjorie Taylor Greene has thrown her support in with McCarthy, but this is the woman who referred to uh, Nancy Pelosi uh, as being part of the uh, Jewish gazpacho. In her ignorance, and that's all I can say, in her dangerous ignorance, what she was referring to was a claim against the three groups I was talking about. Those spy operations became known, and conservative writers like Westbrook Pegler, uh, the kind of Fox News of his time, wrote about the Jewish Gestapo, not the Jewish Gaspacho. But you also have Lauren Bobbert and Matt Goetz who have made openly anti-Semitism, I mean, really nasty, not what I would call British anti-Semitism, which is very polite, but just as deadly, just done with a smile and a nod. This is openly anti-Semitic and the Republican party leaders have said nothing, zero. So if you're a Republican, listening to this talk today, I would urge you to write your congressperson, call their office, and let them know that you will not vote for that party anymore if they continue to put up for office known anti-Semites and racists. That's one thing you can all do. Thank you. Um, hi, Aglaia. 
Hi. Okay, so one of my soapboxes um, within the past couple of years has been about all of the, like, you know, whining, crying, whatever you want to call it about critical race theory is going to make white kids feel bad about being white and all that other stuff. Okay, so to be perfectly honest with you, um, one of the things that I see just, you know, thinking about here, though, is that people like Madoff and Stoner are not above taking advantage of white kids who are alienated, some of them are drug addicts, you know, young, you know, these hate groups do take advantage of young white kids who have whatever problems. Sometimes their parents have no idea that they've been exposed to all this hate stuff. And then they recruit and they brainwash this young person. Mm -hmm. And so that's one thing that I haven't seen a lot of in the dialogue is about all of the like, you know, will someone who's in a hate group take advantage of any white kid? And so hence, would critical race theory be another a way of protecting this, you know, child from people like made all and you know david duke and so on and so forth all right that there's two parts to your uh comment slash question the first is uh from the beginning and beginning mean 1945 as these veterans came back there were two groups they recruited discontented veterans and the big group was teenagers yes who, who didn't have jobs or their jobs paid them minimum you know the equivalent of there wasn't a minimum wage then but it basically barely enough money to exist on. And these people saw themselves as having no future. And they were lured by having uniforms and marching and uh, basically being violent against blacks and Jews. As for critical race theory, I don't think critical race theory is going to stop anyone from hating. And frankly, I, I think there was a major mistake I, I've written a lot about political language and how we use political language. I never would have called it polit uh, critical race theory. I think that was a major error. I would have called it American social history and the history of black Americans who have been part of America. And during these years from the 1600s till 1865, they were slaves. And let's talk about how slavery then affected every aspect of American life. By simply saying critical race theory, it's as though this is something separate from American history. And that has allowed right wing critics to, in fact, you know, undermine the whole thing, where I think they'd have a harder time if, because when I teach this, I call it American social history, history from the bottom up. I look at blacks, I look at Jews, I look at minorities, I look at immigrants, all these people. In other words, many of us were taught American history as being memorize the names, dates, and facts of who the political leaders are, right? And it's the most boring thing in the world. And when my students say to me, I hated history in high school, I said, well, you had teachers who made you memorize everything and offered you no context. Like, why do I need this stuff? What, you know, what irrelevance does it have to me? And my students who said, I love American history in high school would say, well, that's because my teacher placed things in a context. So I didn't have to memorize things I had to understand why things were the way they were. And that's what we need to get into school. And again, if you call it American history rather than critical race history, it is part of a whole, it is not a separate thing. Okay, thanks. I'm, I'll, and I'm also a history professor, so you're, you're preaching to the choir here. Okay. So. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Anyone, who else wants to jump in here? This is your chance. Anything you've wanted to know that maybe I can't answer. Okay, we have a question from Joyce and then from Eddie. You're still on mute, Joyce. Oh, there you go. Great. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, the rise in anti Semitism has been pretty horrific. Um, I just came from uh, Katie Hobbs' observation where a fantastic rabbi talked about the anti Semitism that's going on. And I know it has reared its ugly head for, you know, a thousand years. To make some comments about what we're seeing today, and it seems much more virulent and much more acceptable than previously. Well, actually, it is not more virulent, or uh, it is more acceptable among certain groups. But uh, one of the policies of the American Jewish Committee, th these three groups really differed in how they should handle it. The American Jewish Committee from the 45 on believed in what they called the quarantine method. They said the more publicity you give to these groups, 
the more likely they are to get greater number of, a, of, of um, members. The American, the Anti-Defamation League wanted to expose these groups and put it out into the open as did the Anti-Nazi League. What I would say is during the 50s, uh, in the book I'm writing, it is as nasty in the 50s and 60s as it is today. Just because of social media, we didn't know all this. Because we have now entered a world of 24 seven news, when you have to report constantly on things, things that would have slipped under the radar are now on the radar. And the other thing, the, the biggest change is that these groups through social media have now been able to contact both their members and members of like-minded groups throughout the country and throughout the world. That has allowed them to coordinate their efforts more than they ever had in the past. And so that's part of what you're seeing. And finally, I do wanna put the part of the blame at Donald Trump's feet and the Republican party. We have never had a president who has spoken in the way that he has spoken, whether it's about women, about minorities, about immigrants, about any group. He is a vile person. He is an un-American as far as I'm concerned, because no one calls, no true American calls for violence against another American. You can disagree. You can disagree. You can run an opposition party, but you don't call on your supporters to do damage and violence. And the Republican Party has allowed in a number of outright racists. When Donald Trump meets in Mar-a-Lago with yay and a prominent white supremacist and no one says boo or very few people say boo about it it empowers all these hate groups to come out from under the rocks and that's what i would say the difference is they have now come out those rocks have always been there they have always been there but they have been much a they were quieter or b they didn't get the publicity they now get through social media that's the biggest change and that the Republican Party, um, and I would say the same thing if it was the Democrats, the Republican Party is more concerned with power than they are with ideas, policies, and Americanism. Thank you so, so much. Let, can I just add another question? So now that it is out there and is more acceptable, mm -hmm. acceptable, do you think that it will grow to a certain extent more than it has previously? No, I think it's actually going to decline more. And I think part of it is, <clears throat> I was very heartened by the midterm elections because just about all the Trump uh, endorsed candidates lost, all the election deniers, almost all of them lost. And I think there's a reckoning within the base of the Republican party constituency that the party has gone too far. And that the next step will be when they stop electing uh, people to office who are overtly anti-Semitic and racist. Thank you. Um, um, over to you, Eddie. Thank you so much. Um, I, I I really uh, resonate with uh, a lot of, of what you showed. Um, and it hits me deep because for me, for my immigration paperwork, a lot of what I um, have to write, the most common question that nullifies any sort of immigration process is a question that says, are you part of the Nazi Communist Party? If so, click here. Because if you do, you're allowed to be deported. Uh -huh. Click yes on there. And I think it's interesting that so many Americans are openly Nazis and, and openly support this type of fascism. And there is zero consequence. Whereas like for me, it, it could like literally having a flag or support could lead to my deportation. Um, another thing, and finally, my question to you is, at what point do you think um, there is a turning point of radicalization because there has to be a certain point where folks are like, eh, I'm conservative, but then we switch to the radical conservatives who, who see violence as the only answer. In your opinion, what, what is a key piece that radicalizes a lot of, of um, the people that we see turning violent? Well, uh, I would say if history is a lesson, it was a Supreme Court decision. It's Brown versus Board of Education. That was the moment when uh, these single calls for protest really exploded into a national call for protest and for violence. 
That's when we had the big bombings of black churches and Jewish institutions. That's when the National States Rights Party, the National States Rights Party starts in 1958. And basically what they're, they've got a two part plan. Uh, we are going to quietly, secretly, J.B. Stoner behind the uh, veil, so to say, is responsible for many of those bombings. It, it would take forever for him to finally be convicted of a 1963 church bombing. Uh, he is, the strategy is we are going to terrorize the nation. And then when people get so filled with terror that they're anxious, who's going to save us? We're going to come in and say, see, we're the only ones who understand this. And we are going to now save America. But Americans never voted in large numbers for the National States Rights Party. They tended to vote for states' rights uh, people in the Democratic and then the Dixiecrats, who then you know, left the Democratic Party and became the Republican Party. The thing to understand, again, about these what I call hate groups, they don't call themselves hate groups. They call themselves nationalists because they believe that they are the patriots. And all of you who are watching this today are perverted by liberalism. You don't understand that what made America great, and I'm not simply talking about Trump now, what made America great was white Christians who founded our country and built a civilization. And they would often point to Africa. They say, look how old Africa is, and they're still heathens, they're still savages. And the other thing, because um, I asked my rabbi once, I belong to Leo Beck in uh, Los Angeles. I asked my rabbi, why do you think that real devout Christians are supporting this? Uh, and he had one uh, answer, which is, you know, read the Bible and you can see how much of the Bible is violent, really violent, particularly the New Testament. But I would offer a second explanation, which is something I learned about early in my research was starting with Jesse Stoner in 1944, 45, 46. He justified his call for the mass extermination of Jews by employing which is now known as Christian identity theology. And that was developed in England in 1889, which is known as British Israelism, came over here, began coming over here in the 40s and really got popularized in the 50s. And Christian identity theology, in a nutshell, says Jews are not the chosen people. This is a myth that they have been trying to foist on everybody for thousands of years. In fact, Jews are the offspring of Satan and Eve, that it was Satan in the form of the serpent who copulated with Eve, and that in turn created uh, you know, Cain and Abel, uh, not just Adam, Cain and Abel, and uh, we have one brother killing the other, and that was the beginning of it all. And until we need to, um, in fact, we are doing Jews a favor by killing them, because otherwise their unborn children are all going to go to hell. And by killing Jews and restoring true Christianity, we can save their children from imagine not just a lifetime, but an infinite existence in hell. And there are many other parts of Christian identity, but that at its core is to be a good Christian, you can in fact kill Jews, and that blacks are not even human beings. Blacks are mud people who are created out of kind of like the um, golems in Jewish mythology that are created out of mud and take on a human existence. So therefore, if you kill blacks, you're also not killing human beings. So this all comes out of a theological understanding. And I would argue it's a little more sophisticated today, but that notion of Christian identity is being preached by many of the groups um, like Aryan nations and others who still see white Christians as the core of America and the only salvation for the destruction of America by Jews, blacks, and various minorities, who we know, according to the census, are going to make white Americans a plurality uh, within the next 20 years. Professor, and when I say I, I, white Americans, by the way, just remember that Jews are not white. 
For many of these people, Jews have never been white. They are an other. Uh, I, I, I have my last two questions here, but I want to be sensitive to your time if you need to go now. No, I'm fine. Okay, so my last two questions, and feel free to answer briefly. My, the, the first one is <clears throat> on the topic of intersectionality. On the one hand, there seems to be a positive development there in the sense that we're all in this together, coalition building. On the other hand, it can kind of lead to a bandwagon, uh, a, ba a bandwagoning ideology and can kind of do a disservice to the, to, to the nuances involved in hate. So how do you think about intersectionality, pros and cons? That's the first question. The second one is, <laughs> from, from, from the long view of history, is there a kind of Jew that those inclined to hate actually like? Um, it seems like when Jews are rich, you're blamed for that. If they're poor and weak, you're blamed for that. If you're a capitalist, you're blamed for that or a communist for that. If you have a state, you're blamed for having a state. And, and if you try to influence the state that's not yours, you're blamed. Or if you try to separate from society, you're blamed. But if you integrate. But was there a type of Jew historically that actually kind of fit the, you know, fit the mold of what those inclined towards hate actually liked? Well, let me just talk about the 19th and 20th century. I, I, I'm Great. not going to go back to, you know, be, before that. But <laughs> Jews can't win. That's the answer because Jews are both responsible for leading world capitalism, for being in charge of banks, finance, media industry, everything that is modern and everything that uh, Jews can put their dirty grubby fingers on, they will control. And the flip side of that, that we saw with the cold, well, actually with the creation of the Soviet Union in 1917, that Jews are also communists who are trying to overthrow and destroy capitalism. And in the process of overthrowing and destroying capitalism, they will also attack Christianity. So Jews are both the villains on the left and the villains on the right. And there is no typical Jew because you can just decide which kind of Jew you want to attack. That's what makes Jews so great as targets and scapegoats that you can scapegoat them for anything but they don't scapegoat poor Jews. Um, I'm not sure about your question on intersectionality. Maybe you could put it in a different way because I'm not sure what you're asking me. Do you, um, what do you see as the positives or the downsides towards lumping all kind of hate together um, regardless of who, who, of, who, of who or what the target is? The danger is that they are gonna lump themselves together that they are going to create a united fascist front. Um, and this is what was going on. The, the thing that most uh, struck me about the National Renaissance Party, because you know, as an author, you're always gonna get questions. Well, you write about this group and really at the most, maybe they had a thousand paying members. That's not what made them important. They were trying to create an international fascist front. And more than any other American organization, they were pulling together fascists throughout the world. That is my fear to this day, is that there's so many rivalries on the far right, on the extreme far right, that they have been unable, those leaders, to really pull together a united movement. And if they do, if they figure out a way to do that, then I think Jews, Blacks, and all minorities are going to face a whole new level of persecution and um, physical violence. And I, I will be honest, for the first time in my life, uh, my wife and I have talked about taking gun lessons. Our parents, her parents are German emigres who came before the war. My parents are Holocaust survivors who came after the war. And I don't wanna have somebody drive up to my home one day with guns and start painting swastikas on um, my garage, and worse than that, trying to break into my home. And I've written some op-eds, and I've gotten hate mail just from op-eds, nasty hate mails about Jew bastard commie faggot. That is literally the language, that's the nicer language used in those letters, so much so that I have to set up a police file. <laughs> that's what frightens me, that these groups are going to figure out how to work together, and then all of us are in trouble. Professor Ross, this was incredibly informative. Thank you for the, the, the work you're doing and the writing you're doing and the teaching. We appreciate it so much. Um, and thank you all for joining today. We hope you'll join us next week. Uh, we have two programs coming up um, with Rabbi David Wolpe, Building a Better Life, 
And then we're doing Being Intimate with the Bible with Dr. Johnny Schnitzer. So many other opportunities coming up as well. God bless. Thanks all for joining us. Have a great night.